testing. The tax cut faced early skepticism from Democrats and even some Republicans. Vice President George H.W. Bush had belittled supply size theory as voodoo economics during the 1980 Republican primaries. But a combination of skill and serendipity pushed the bill over the top. Reagan aggressively and effectively lobbied individual members of Congress for support on the measure. Then on March 30th, 1981, Reagan survived an assassination attempt by a mentally unstable young man named John Hickling. Repub public support swelled for the hospitalized president. Congress ultimately approved a $675 billion ta tax cut in July 81 with significant Democratic support. The bill reduced overall federal taxes by more than one quarter and lowered the top marginal rate from 70% to 50%, with the bottom rate dropping from 14 to 11%. It also slashed the rate on capital gains from 28% to 20%. The next month, Reagan scored another political triumph in the response to a strike called by the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO. During the 80 campaign, Reagan had wooed organized labor, describing himself as an old union man. He had led the Screen Actors Guild from 1947 to 52, who still held Franklin Roosevelt in high regard. PATCO had been one of the few labor, labor unions to endorse Reagan. Nevertheless, the president ordered the union striking air traffic controllers back to work and fired more than 11,000 who refused. Reagan's actions crippled PATCO and led to the American labor movement reeling. For the rest of the 80s, the economic terrain of the United States, already unfavorable to union organizing, shifted decisively in favor of employers. The unionized portion of the private sector workforce fell from 20% in 1980 to 12% in 1990. Reagan's tax bill and the defeat of PATCO not only enhanced the economic power of corporations and high-income households, they confirmed that a new age, conservative age, had dawned on American life. The new administration appeared to be flying high in the fall of 81, but developments changed the rosy economic forecasts emanating from the White House. As Reagan ratcheted up tensions with the Soviet Union, Congress approved his request for $1.2 trillion in new military spending. This combination of lower taxes and higher defense budgets caused the national debt to balloon. By the end of Reagan's first term, it equaled 53% GDP as opposed to 33% in 81. The increase was staggering, especially for an administration that promised to curb spending. Meanwhile, Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker continued his policy from the card years of combating inflation by maintaining high interest rates, which surpassed 20% in June 1981. The Fed's actions increased the cost of borrowing money and stifled economic activity. As a result, the United States experienced a severe economic recession in 81 and 82. Unemployment rose to nearly 11%, the highest figure since the Great Depression. Reductions in social welfare spending also heightened the impact of recession on ordinary people. Congress had fallen Reagan's lead by reducing funding for food stamps and aid to families with dependent children and removed half a million people from the Supplemental Social Security Program for the physically disabled. The cuts exacted an especially harsh toll on low-income communities of color. The head of the NAACP declared that the administration's budget cuts had rekindled war, pestilence, famine, and death. Reagan also received bipartisan rebuke in 1981 after proposing cuts to Social Security benefits for early retirees. The Senate voted unanimously to condemn the plan, and Democrats framed it as a heartless attack on the elderly. Confronted with recessions and a harsh public criticism, and a chastened White House worked with the Democratic House Speaker Tip O'Neill in 1982 on a bill that restored um, $98 billion of their year's previous tax cuts. Despite compromising with the administration on taxes, Democrats rallied against the so-called Reagan recession, arguing that the president's economic policies favored the most fortunate Americans. This appeal, which Democrats termed the fairness issue, helped them win 26 House seats in the autumnal congressional races. The new right appeared to be in trouble. Morning in America. Reagan nimbly adjusted to the political setbacks of 1982. Following rejection of his Social Security proposals, Reagan appointed a bipartisan panel to consider changes to the program. In 83, the commission recommended a one-time delay of cost of living expenses, a new requirement that government employees pay into the system and a gradual increase in the retirement age of 65 to 67. 
The commission also proposed raising state and federal payroll taxes with new revenue poured into a trust fund that would transform Social Security from a pay-as-you-go system to one with significant reserve. Congress quickly passed the recommendation into law, allowing Reagan to take credit for strengthening the program cherished by most Americans. The president also benefited by, from an economic rebound. Real disposal income rose 2.5% in 83 and 5.8% the following year. Unemployment dropped from 7.5% 7, 7 in 1984. Meanwhile, the harsh medicine of high interest rates helped induce reflation to 3.5%. While campaign for, campaigning for re election in 1984, Reagan pointed to the improving economy as evidence that it was mourning in America again. His personal popularity soared. Most conservatives ignored the debt increase in the tax hikes in the previous two years and rallied around the president. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, stood at an ideological crossroads in 1984. The favorite to win the presidential party's nomination was Walter Mondale a staunch ally of organized labor and the civil rights movement as a senator during the 1960s and 70s. He later served as Jim Carter's vice president. Mondale's chief rivals were the civil rights activist Jesse Jackson and Colorado Senator Gary Hart, one of the young Democrats elected to Congress in 1974 following Nixon's downfall. Hart and other Watergate babies still identified themselves as liberals but rejected the party's faith in activist government and embraced market-based approaches to policy issues. In doing so, they conceded significant political ground to supply sires and conservative opponents of the welfare state. Many Democrats, however, were not prepared to abandon their New Deal heritage, so the ideological tension within the party played out in the 1984 primary campaign. Jackson offered a largely progressive program but won only two states. Hart's program, economically moderate but socially liberal, inverted the po political format of Mondale's New Deal-style liberalism. Throughout the primaries, Hart contrasted his new ideas with Mondale's old-fashioned politics. Mondale eventually secured his party's nomination, but just suffered a crushing defeat in the general election. Reagan captured 49 of 50 states, winning 58.8% of the popular vote. Mondale's loss seemed to confirm that the new breed of moderate Democrats better understood the mood of the American people. The future of the party belonged to the post-New Deal liberals like Hart and to the constituency that supported him in the primaries upwardly mobile white professionals and suburbanites. In February 1985, a group of centrists formed the Democratic Leadership Council as a vehicle for distancing so themselves from organized labor and Keynesian economics while cultivating the business community. Jesse Jackson dismissed the DLC as Democrats for the leisure class, but the organization included many of the party's future leaders, including Arkansas's governor, Bill Clinton. The formation of the DLC illustrated the degree which the new right had of transformed American politics. New Democrats looked a lot like old Republicans. Reagan entered his second term with a much stronger mandate than in 81, but the grand old party makeover of Washington, D.C. stalled. Democrats regained control of the Senate in 1986, and Democratic opposition re prevented Reagan from eliminating means-tested social welfare programs, although Congress failed to increase benefit levels for welfare programs or raise the minimum wage, decreasing the real value of those benefits. Democrats and Republicans occasionally fashioned legislative compromises, such as the Tax Reform Act of 1986. The bill lowered the top cor uh, corporate tax rate from 46% to 30 4% and reduced the highest marginal income rate from 50% to 28%, while also simplifying the tax code and eliminating numerous loopholes. The steep cuts in the corporate and individual rates certainly benefited wealthy individuals, but the legislation made virtually no net change to federal revenues. In 1986, Reagan also signed into law the Immigration Reform and Control Act. American policymakers hope to do two things deal with the millions of undocumented immigrants already in the United States while simultaneously choking off future unsanctioned migration. Pardon me, unsanctioned migration. The former goal was achieved. Nearly three million undocumented workers received legal status, but the later proved elusive. One of Reagan's most far-reaching victories occurred through the judicial appointments. He named 368 district and federal appeals courts judges during his two terms. Observer noticed that all, almost all of the appointees were white men. Seven were African-American, 15 were Latino, and two were Asian-American. Reagan also appointed three Supreme Court justices, Sandra Day O'Connor, who, to the dismay of the religious right, turned out to be moderate, Anthony Kennedy, a solidly conservative Catholic who occasionally sided with the court's liberal wing, and an 
uh, arch conservative Anton Scalia. The new rights transformation of the judiciary had limits. In 1978, uh, 1987, Reagan nominated Robert Bjork to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. Bjork, a federal judge and former Yale University law professor, was a staunch conservative. He had opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, affirmative action, and the Roe v. Wade decision. After acrimonious confirmation hearings, the Senate rejected Bjork's nomination by a vote of 58 to 42. African American Life in Reagan's America. African Americans read Bjork's, uh, Bork's confirmation as another signal of conservative movement's hostility to their social, economic, and political aspirations. Indeed, Ronald Reagan's America presented African Americans with a series of contradictions. Black Americans achieved significant advances in politics, culture, and socioeconomic status. A trend from the late 60s and 70s continued as black politicians gained control of, major, of major municipal governments across the country in the 80s. In 1983, voters in Philadelphia and Chicago elected Wilson Good and Harold Washington respectively as their city's first black mayors. At the national level, civil rights leader Jesse Jackson became the first American, African American man to run for president when he campaigned for the Democratic Party's nomination in 1984 and 88. Propelled by chance of Run Jesse Run, Jackson Rich achieved notable success in 88, winning nine state primaries and finishing second with 29% of the vote. The excitement created by Jackson's campaign mirrored the acclaim uh, received by a few prominent African Americans in media and entertainment. Comedian Eddie Murphy rose to start him on television Saturday Night Live and achieved box office success with movies like 48 Hours and Beverly Hills Cop. In 1982, pop singer Michael Jackson released Thriller, the best-selling album of all time. Oprah Winfrey became her phenomenally successful nationally syndicated television show in 1985. Comedian Bill Cosby's sitcom about an African-American doctor and lawyer raising their four children drew the highest ratings on television for most of the decade. The popularity of the Cosby show revealed how class informed uh, uh, perceptions, pardon me. The popularity of the Cosby show revealed how class and formed perceptions of race in the 1980s. Cosby's fictional television TV family represented a growing number of black middle class professionals in the United States. Indeed, income from the top fifth of African American households increased faster than that of white households for most of the decade. Middle class African Americans found new doors open to them in the 1980s, but poor and working class continued to face challenges. During Reagan's last years in office, the African American poverty late property rate stood at 31.6% as opposed to 10.1% for whites. Black unemployment remained double that of whites throughout the decade. By 1990, the median income for black families was 2,000, uh, pardon me. By 1990, the median income for black families was $21,000, was $21, 42 42% below the median income for white households. The Reagan administration failed to address such disparities in many ways intensified them. New right values threatened the legal principles and federal policies of the Great Society and rights Re revolution. Reagan's appointment of conservatives to agencies such as the Justice Department and the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission took aim at key policy achievements of the civil rights movement. When the 1965 Voting Rights Act came up for new renewal during Reagan's first term, the Justice Department pushed the president to oppose any extension. Only the intervention of more moderate congressional Republicans saved the law. The administration also initiated a plan to rescind federal affirmative action rules. In 1986, a broad coalition of groups, including the NAACP, the Urban League, the ALFCO, and even the National Association of Manufacturers, compelled the administration to abandon the effort. Despite the conservative tenor of the country, diverse programs were firmly entrenched in the corporate world by the end of the decade. Americans increasingly embraced racial diversity as a positive value, but often approached the issue through an individualistic, not systematic framework. Certain federal policies disproportionately affected racial minorities. Spending cuts enacted by Reagan and congressional Republicans shrank aid to families with dependent children, Medicaid food stamps, food lunch school or school lunch programs, and jobs training programs that provided crucial support to African American households. Pardon me. In 1982, the National Urban League's annual State of Black America report concluded that never since the first report in 1976 has the state of black America been more vulnerable. Never in that time have black economic rights been under such powerful attack. In 
African American communities, especially those in urban areas, also bore the stigma of violence and criminality. Homicide was the leading case, leading case of death for black males between the ages of 15 and 24, occurring at a rate six times higher than other groups. Although African Americans most often were most often the victims of violent crime, sensationalist media reports indicted fears about black and black black and white crime in big cities. Ironically, such fear could spark itself itself could spark violence. In December 1984, 37-year-old white engineer Bernard Gotts shot and seriously wounded four black teenagers on a New York City subway car. The so-called subway uh, vigilante suspected that the young men armed with screwdrivers planned to rob him. Pollsters found that 90% of white uh, New Yorkers sympathized with Gotts. Echoing the law and order rhetoric and policies of the 60s and 70s, Politicians, both Democratic and Republican, and law enforcement agencies implemented more aggressive policing of minority communities and made it in longer prison sentences for those arrested. The explosive growth of mass incarceration uh, exacted a heavy toll on African American communities long before into the 21st century. Bad times and good times. Working in middle-class Americans, especially those of color, struggled to maintain economic equilibrium during the Reagan years. The growing national debt generated fresh economic pain. The federal government borrowed money to finance the debt, raising interest rates to heighten the appeal of government bonds. Foreign money poured into the United States, raising the value of the dollar and attracting an influx of goods from overseas. The imbalance between American imports and exports grew from $36 billion in 1980 to $170 billion in 1987. Foreign competition battered the RA anemic manufacturing sector. The appeal of government bonds likewise drew investors away from American industry. Continuing an ongoing trend, many steel and automobile factories in the industrial Northeast and Midwest closed or moved overseas during the 1980s. Bruce Springsteen, the self-appointed bard of Blue Collar America, offered eulogies to Rust Belt cities in songs like Youngstown and My Hometown, which the narrator, narrator laments, Foreman says, these jobs are going, boys, and they ain't coming back. Competition from Japanese car makers spurred a Buy American campaign. Meanwhile, a farm crisis gripped the rural United States. Expanded world production meant new competition for American farmers, while soaring interest rates caused the already sizable debt held by family farms to mushroom. Farm foreclosures skyrocketed during Reagan's tenure. In September 1985, prominent musicians, including Neil Young and Willie Nelson, organized, organized Farm Aid, a benefit concert at the University of Illinois football stadium designed to raise money for struggling farmers. At the end of the economic spectrum, wealthy Americans thrived under the policies of the new right. The financial industry found new ways to earn staggering profits during the Reagan years. Wall Street brokers like junk bond king Michael Milken reaped the fortunes of selling high-risk, high-yield securities. Reckless speculation helped drive the stock market steadily upward until the crash on October 19, 1987. On Black Friday, the market plunged 800 points, erasing 13% of its value. Investors lost more than $500 billion. An additional financial crisis loomed in the savings and loan industry, and Reagan, Reagan's, deregula Reagan's deregulatory policies bore significant responsibility. In 1982, Reagan signed a bill increasing the amount of federal insurance available to savings and loan uh, depositors, making those financial institutions more popular with consumers. The bill also allowed the SNLs to engage in high-risk loans and investments for the first time. Many such deals failed catastrophically. Catastro many such deals failed catastrophically, while some SNL manage managers brazenly stole from their institutions. In the late 80s, SNL failed with regularity, and ordinary Americans lost precious savings. The 1982 law left the government responsible for bailing out SNLs at an eventual cost of 132 billion. Cultural wars of the 1980s. Popular culture of the 80s offered another venue in which conservatives and liberals waged a battle of ideas. The militarism and patriotism of Reagan's presidency pervaded in movies like Top Gun and the Rambo series, starring Sylvester Stallone as a Vietnam War veteran haunted by his country's failure to pursue victory in Southeast Asia. In contrast, director Oliver Stone offered a searing condemnation of the war in Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. Television shows like Dynasty in Dallas celebrated wealth and glamour, 
reflecting the pride and conspicuous consumption that emanated from the White House and corporate boardrooms during the decade. At the same time, films like Wall Street and novels such as Brett Easton Ellis is less than zero, skewer the excesses of the rich. The most significant aspect of popular culture in the 1980s, however, was its lack of politics altogether. Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial and his Indiana Jones Adventure Trilogy topped the box office. Cinematic escapism replaced the social films of the 1970s. Quintessential Hollywood leftist Jane Fonda appeared frequently on television, but only to pedal exercise videos. Television viewership, once dominated by the three big networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS, fragmented with the rise of cable channels catering to particularized tastes. Few cable channels so popular captured the popular imagination as MTV, which debuted in 1981. Telegenic artists like Madonna, Prince, and Michael Jackson skillfully used MV, MTV to boost their reputations and album sales. Conservatives commit, condemned music videos corrupting youth. Uh, conservatives condemned music videos cor for corrupting young people with vulgar, anti-authoritarian method, messages. But the medium only grew in stature. Critics of MTV targeted Madonna in particular. Her 1989 video, Like a Prayer, drew protests for what some people viewed as sexually suggestive and blasphemous, blasphemous scenes. The religious right increasingly perceived popular culture as hostile to Christian values. The Apple II computer, introduced in 1977, was the first successfully mass-produced microcomputer meant for home use. Cultural battles were even more heated in the realm of gender and sexual politics. American women pushed further into male-dominated spheres during the 80s. By 84, women in the workforce outnumbered those who worked at home. The same year, New York Representative Geraldine Ferraro became the first woman to run on a major party's presidential ticket when Democratic candidate Walter Mondale named her his running mate. Yet the triumph of the right placed fund of fundamental questions about women's rights near the center of American politics particularly in regard to abortion, the issue that increasingly divided Americans. Pro-life Democrats and pro-choice Republicans grew rare as the National Abortion Rights Action League induced pro-choice orthodoxy on the left, and the National Right to Life Commission did the same with the pro-life orthodoxy on the right. Religious conservatives took advantage of the Republican takeover of the White House and Senate in 1980 to push new restrictions on abortions with limited success. Senator, Senators Jesse Helms of North Carolina and Orrin Hatch of Utah introduced versions of the Human Life Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that defined life as a beginning of contraception. Both efforts failed. Reagan, more interested in economic issues than social ones, provided only lukewarm support for the anti-abortion movement. His, he further outright raged anti-abortion activists by appointing Sandra Day O'Connor, a supporter, supporter of abortion rights, the Supreme Court. Despite these setbacks, anti-abortion forces succeeded in defunding some abortion providers. The 1976 Hyde Amendment prohibited the use of federal funds to pay for abortions. By 1990, almost every state had its own version of the Hyde Amendment. Yet some anti-abortion activists demanded war. More. In 1988, uh, evangelical activist Randall Terry founded Operation Rescue, an organization targeting abortion clinics and pro-choice politicians with confrontational and sometimes violent tactics. Operation Rescue demonstrated that the fight over abortion would grow only more heated in the 1990s. The emergence of a deadly new Ill illness acquired Im immune... Pardon me. The emergence of a deadly new illness acquired immune deficiency syndrome. AIDS simultaneously devastated, stigmatized, and energized the nation's homosexual community. When AIDS appeared in the early 1980s, most of its victims were gay men. For, the time, for a time, the disease was known as GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. The epidemic rekindled older pseudoscience ideas about the inherent uh, inherently diseased nature of homosexual bodies. The Reagan administration met the issue with indifference, leading liberal congressman Henry Waxman to rage if the same disease had appeared among Americans of Norwegian descent rather than among gay males, the response to both the government and the medical community would be different. Some religious figures seem to relish the opportunity to, to condemn homosexual activity. Catholic columnist Patrick Buchanan remarked that the sexual revolution has begun to devour its children. One moment. Homosexuals were left to forge their own response to the crisis. Some turned to confrontation, 
like New York play, playwright Larry Kramer. Kramer founded the Gay Men's Health Crisis, which demanded a more proactive response to the others sought to humanize AIDS victims, as with the of the AIDS Memorial Quilt, a commemorative project that began in 1985. By the middle of the decade, the federal government began to address the issue haltingly. One moment. Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, an evangelical Christian, called for more federal funding on AIDS-related research, much to the dismay of critics on the religious right. By 1987, government spending on AIDS-related research reached uh, 50 million, 500 million, and still only 25% of what experts advocated. In 1987, Reagan convened a presidential commission on AIDS. The commission's report called for an anti-discrimination laws to protect people with AIDS and for more federal funding on AIDS research. The shift in encouraged activists. Nevertheless, on issues of abortion and gay rights, as with the push for racial equality, activists spent the 1980s preserving the status quo rather than building on previous gains. The amounted, this amounted to significant victory for the new right. The new right abroad. The conservative movement gained ground on gender and sexual politics, and it, but it captured the entire battlefield on American foreign policy in the 1980s, at least for a time. Ronald Reagan entered an office, committed a committed Cold Warrior. He held the Soviet Union in contempt, denouncing it in a 1983 speech as the evil empire. And he never doubted that the Soviet Union would end up on the ash heap of history. He said in 1982, he said in a 1982 speech to the British Parliament. Indeed, Reagan believed that it was the duty of the United States to speed the Soviet Union to its inevitable demise. His Reagan doctrine declared that the United States would supply aid to anti-communist forces everywhere in the world. To give this doctrine force, Reagan oversaw an enormous expansion of the defense budget. Federal spending on defense rose from $171 billion in 1981 to $229 billion in 1985, the highest level since the Vietnam War. He described this as a policy of peace through strength, a phrase that appealed to Americans who, during the 1970s, feared that the United States was losing its status as the world's most powerful nation. Yet the irony is that Reagan, for all his militarism, helped to bring the Cold War to end through negotiation, a tactic he once scorned. Reagan's election came at a time when many Americans faced feared the country was on an irreversible decline. American forces withdrew in disarray from South Vietnam in 1975. The Americans, the United States returned control of the Panama Canal to Panama in 1978, despite protests from conservatives. Pro-American dictators were toppled in Iran and Nicaragua in 1979. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan that same year, leading conservatives to warn about American weakness in the face of Soviet expansion. Reagan spoke to fears about decline and warned in 1976 that this nation has become number two in a world where it is dangerous, if not fatal, to be second best. The Reagan administration made Latin America a showcase for its newly asserted politics. Jimmy Carter had sought to promote human rights in the region, but Reagan and his advisors scrapped this approach and instead focused on fighting communism a term they applied to all Latin American left-wing movements. And so when communists with ties to Cuba overthrew the government of the Caribbean, me and Caribbean, pardon me. And so when communists with ties to Cuba overthrew the government of the Caribbean nation of Granada in October 1983, Reagan dispatched the U.S. Marines to the island. Dubbed Operation Urgent Fury, Granada invasion overthrew the leftist government in less than two weeks of fighting. Despite relatively minor nation of the nation, its success gave victory-hungry Americans something to cheer about after military debacles of the previous two decades. Granada was the only time Reagan deployed the American military in Latin America, but the United States also influenced the region by supporting right-wing anti-communist movements there. From 81 to 90, the United States gave more than $4 billion to the governments of El Salvador in a largely futile effort to defeat the guerrillas of the Farba Nuno Martin National Liberation Front, FMLN. Salvadorian security forces equipped with American weapons committed numerous atrocities, including the slaughter of almost 1,000 civilians at the village of El Mozote in December 1981. The Reagan administration took a more cautious approach to the Middle East, where its policy was determined by a mix of anti-communism and hostility towards the Islamic government of Iran. 
when our, uh, Iraq invaded Iran in 1980, the United States supplied Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein with military intelligence and business creditors, even after it became clear that the Iraqi forces were using chemical weapons. Reagan's greatest setback in the Middle East came in 1982, when shortly after Israel invaded Lebanon, he dispatched the Marines to the Lebanese city of Beirut to serve as peacekeeping force. On October 23, 1983, a suicide bomber killed 241 Marines stationed in Beirut. The congressional pressure and anger from the American public forced Reagan to recall the Marines from Lebanon in March uh, 1984. Reagan's decision demonstrated that for all his talk of restoring American power, he took a pragmatic approach to foreign policy. He was unwilling to risk another Vietnam by committing American troops to Lebanon. Though Reagan's policy soared Central American and Middle Eastern power, uh, Middle Eastern, the Middle East aroused protests, his policy on nuclear weapons generated the most controversy. Initially, Reagan followed the examples of President Nixon, Ford, and Carter by pursuing arms limitation talks with the Soviet Union. American officials participated in the intermediate range nuclear force talks that began in 1981 and strategic arm reduction talks start in 1982. But the breakdown in these talks in 83 led Reagan to proceed with plans to place perishing two uh, nuclear missiles in Western Europe to counteract Soviet SS-20 missiles in Eastern Europe. Reagan went a step further in March 1983 when he announced plans for a strategic defense initiative, a space-based system that could shoot down, shoot down incoming missiles. Critics derided the program as Star Wars fantasy, and even Reagan's, Reagan's advisors harbored doubts. We just don't have the technology to do this, Secretary of State George Shultz told aides. These aggressive policies fed a growing nuclear freeze movement throughout the world. In the United States, organizations like the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy organized protests that accumulated in a June 1982 rally that drew almost a million people to New York City's Central Park. One moment. Protests in the streets were echoed by resistance in Congress. Congressional Democrats opposed Reagan's policies on the merits. Congressional Republicans, those who supported Reagan's anti-communism, were wary of the administration's fondness for circumventing Congress. In 1982, the House voted 411 to 0 to approve the Boland Amendment, which barred the United States from supplying funds to the Contras, a right-wing insurgency fighting leftist and so or uh, government in Nicaragua. Reagan overlooking the Contra's brutal tactics, hailed them as the moral equivalent of the Founding Fathers. The Reagan administration's determination to flout these amendments led to a scandal that almost destroyed Reagan's presidency. Robert McFarlane, the President's National Security Advisor, and Oliver North, a member of the National Security Council, raised money to support the Contras by selling American missiles to Iran and funneling the money to Nicaragua. When their scheme was revealed in 1986, it was hugely embarrassing for Reagan. The president's underlings had not only violated the Boland Amendment, but it also, by selling arms to Iran, make a mockery of Reagan's declaration that America will never make concessions to the terrorists. But while the Iran-Contra affair generated comparisons to the Watergate scandal, investigators were never able to prove Reagan knew about the operation. Without such a smoking gun, talks of impeaching, impeaching Reagan remained simply talk. Though the Iran-Contra scandal tarnished Reagan's administration's image, it did not derail Reagan's most significant achievement, easing tensions with the Soviet Union. This would have seemed impossible during Reagan's first term, but when the president exchanged harsh words with a rapid succession of Soviet leaders, Leonid Bershev, Yuri Andropov, and Konstantin uh, Chernikov, in 1985, however, the aged Chernikov's death handed leadership to Soviet Union Mikhail Gorbachev, who, while a true believer in socialism, nevertheless realized the Soviet Union desperately needed to reform itself. He, was, he instituted a program of Pestrokia, which referred to the restructuring of the Soviet pr program, and Glasnost, which meant greater transparency in government. Gorbachev also reached out to Reagan in hopes of renegotiating and into the arms race, which was bankrupting the Soviet Union. Reagan and Gorbachev met in Geneva, Switzerland in 1985 and Reykjavik, Iceland in 1986. The summits failed to produce any concrete negotiations, but the two leaders developed a relationship unprecedented in the history of U.S.-Soviet relations. The trust made it possible the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty of 1987, which committed both sides to a sharp reduction in their nuclear arsenal. By the late 1980s, the Soviet Empire was crumbling. Reagan successfully 
combined the anti-communist rhetoric, such as his 1987 speech at the Berlin Wall, where he declared, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, tear down this wall with a willingness to negotiate with Soviet leadership. But the most significant causes of collapse weigh within the Soviet Union itself. Soviet allied, Soviet, allied, Soviet allied governments in Eastern Europe tottered under pressure from dissident organizations like Poland, Solidarity, and East Germany's newest form. Some of these countries, such as Poland, were also persuaded from within by the Roman Catholic Church, which had turned uh, toward active anti-communists under Pope John Paul II. And Gorbachev made it clear he would not send the Soviet military to prop up these regimes. They collapsed one by one, and in 1989, in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, and East Germany. Within the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's proposed reforms unraveled the decaying Soviet system rather than bringing its stability. By 1991, the Soviet Union itself had vanished, dissolving into a commonwealth of independent states. Conclusion. Reagan left office in 1988 with the Cold War waning and the economy booming. Booming, pardon me. Unemployment had dipped to 5% in 88. Between 1981 and 1986, gas prices fell from uh, $1.38 per gallon to 50, 95 cents. The stock market recovery from the crash and the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which stood at uh, 950 in 1981, reached 2,239 by the end of Reagan's second term. Yet the economic gains of the decade were unequally distributed. The top fifth of households enjoyed rising incomes while the rest stagnated or declined. In constant, in constant dollars, annual chief executive officer uh, pay rose from $3 million in 1980 to roughly $12 million during Reagan's last year in the White House. Between 1985 and 1989, the number of Americans living in poverty remained steady at 33 million. Real per capita money grew, income only grew at 2% per year, a, a roughly equivalent to the Carter years. Pardon me. The American economy saw more jobs created than lost during the 80s, but half of those jobs were eliminated were in the high income or high paying in industries. Furthermore, half of the new jobs failed to pay wages above the poverty line. The economic divide was most acute for African Americans and Latinos, one-third of whom qualified as poor. The triumph of the right provided it proved incomplete. The number of government employees actually increased under Reagan, with more than 80% of the federal budget committed to defense, entitlement programs, and interests in national debt. Debt, the right's goal of deficit elimination floundered for lack of substantial areas to cut. Between 1980 and 1989, the national debt rose from $914 billion to $2.7 trillion. Despite te steep tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy, the overall tax burden of the American public basically remained unchanged. Moreover, the so-called regressive taxes on payroll and certain goods actually increased the tax burden on low- and middle-income Americans. Finally, Reagan slowed but failed to vanquish the five-decade legacy of economic liberalism. Most New Deal and Great Society proved durable. Government still offered its neediest citizens a safety net, if now a continually shrinking one. Yet the discourse of American politics had irrevocably changed. The prominence of conservative politics ideas grew even more pronounced, even when Democrats controlled Congress for the White House. In response to the con uh, conservative moves of the country, the Democratic Party adopted its own message to accommodate many of the Republicans' Reagan-era ideas and innovations. The United States was on a rightward path. <laughs>